Today on Answers with Bayless Conley. Never underestimate the power of your prayers for your family. Prayer changes things. God hears prayer. There are many questions you are faced with every day. We are all searching for answers that will make a real difference in our lives. It's hard to imagine that these answers might be right in front of us. Get ready to discover answers in the Bible with Bayless Conley. Hello, friend. Welcome to the broadcast today. We have got something amazing to share with you. We're going to be talking about the family. You might say, well, what's so amazing about that? Well, the truth is God had a family before he even had a church. And he has brilliant wisdom when it comes to raising kids, being a good husband, being a good wife. And so we're going to be talking about the fact that family matters and giving you some practical wisdom and insight that you can apply to your marriage, to your family, to your kids, to your life. Why don't you turn in your Bible to Psalm 127, if you would. Psalm 127. And we're going to spend almost the entirety of our time right here in this psalm. Heavenly Father, give us understanding, we pray. We open our hearts and we look to the Holy Spirit to instruct us. And Father, we want to be doers participants in your word, not just admirers. And may Jesus be glorified. Amen. All right, let's read it. Psalm 127, a song of ascents of Solomon. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, and to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he gives his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. I like the way this begins. A song of a sense. That's actually part of verse 1. We find that designation a few other places in the book of Psalms, and it literally means a song of going up higher. Amen. Now, I'm sure there's a musical designation there, but I think there's also another meaning. God's wanting to take us higher. And right away as I read this psalm, I feel this divine tension. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. So God is building, but someone is laboring. There's both reliance and action. There's God's part and there's our part. We're trusting God to build, yet we still labor. We're trusting God to protect, yet we still set the watchman. And God primarily builds and guards through us as we look to him for guidance, for strength, and for wisdom. And he will help us in what we do and the things we can do if we'll look to him for that help, and then he will do the things that we cannot do. Now, there's certainly a lot of applications to these verses we've read, but the primary import has to do with the family. In fact, the word house, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. It's the Hebrew word for family. Unless the Lord builds the family, they labor in vain. In fact, the Hebrew word for son, the Hebrew word for daughter, and the Hebrew word for family all find their root in the word build in this verse. God is saying that he wants to build a legacy with our children. He wants to build a legacy for our families and for, for his kingdom. And then speaking about that, you know, God talks about building our family, and he says it's vain for you to sit up late, rise up early, and eat the bread of sorrows. So he gives his beloved sleep. How many have eaten their meals in sorrow and lost sleep over family matters, especially over issues with children? And you know what? Just because our children have grown up does not diminish their ability to impact our hearts at all. Is that not true? Yeah, they can impact our hearts positively and negatively, no matter what their age might be. 
But the fact is, God does want to help build, and strengthen, and establish our families, but he needs to be invited in. We need to solicit his help. Now, he said, behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. That word heritage means a gift. And the fruit of the womb is a reward. Kids are a gift and a reward. They are not a punishment. And if there's any young parents listening to me right now and you have particularly active children or maybe an overactive child, I have a word from heaven for you today. You will survive. You will. It says the children of our youth are like arrows in the hand of a warrior. As parents, we can send out our kids like arrows far and true. We can send them out into the world with faith in God, with hope with a sense of eternity, with a heart that embraces honesty, integrity, justice, and compassion, especially if they've seen those things modeled in the home. Amen. And I know some parents will say, well, Pastor, you know, we didn't know the Lord raising our kids. Or, man, we just made huge mistakes raising our kids. You know, we did stuff we shouldn't have done. We, we, there's stuff we should have done that we failed to do. And if anything, our arrows have come back and wounded our own hearts. Well, you know what? None of us can change the past. We can't. We can't go back and do the things that we failed to do, nor can we undo the things that we shouldn't have done. And to wallow in condemnation, well, friend, that's just the devil's quicksand. God doesn't want any of us to wallow in condemnation, but we can, what we can do is we can pray. Never underestimate the power of your prayers for your family. Prayer changes things. God hears prayer. Don't underestimate the power of your prayers. God has a million ways to reach your family and to turn someone that's going the wrong direction and get their feet on the right pathway. We can pray. Now, it says, blessed is the man who has his quiver full of them. The quiver's the case that would carry the arrows. And the first thing he says about our children, once we've in God, invited God in to build and to guard, he says, they won't be ashamed. To me, that is a promise of our family's salvation. Listen to this verse. From Isaiah 45 and 17, it says, But Israel shall be saved by the Lord with an everlasting salvation. You shall not be ashamed or disgraced forever and ever. One of the first fruits of salvation is being liberated from shame. The Apostle Paul said to Timothy, For I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed. God says, Your children will not be ashamed, but they'll speak with the enemies in the gate. Another translation says they'll never be defeated by their enemies when they meet them in the gate. And I think we can look at that a couple of ways. In the ancient world, the gates of a city were often the focal point of an attack by an adversary because if the gates fell, the city fell. If the gate fell, the main entrance into the city was now open to the enemy forces. And I think this is a promise that God will protect our children that they will not be overcome by the forces of darkness and that the enemy will not gain an entrance into our children's lives. Amen. Amen. They'll defeat their enemies when they meet them in the gate. And the second way to look at that is that the gate in the ancient world, in fact, throughout Scripture, there's many references. The gate was the place of commerce in the city. It's the place that business was transacted. And sooner or later, our children are going to find out that there are many dishonest and crooked people in the world that will not deal honestly in the arena of business. But the God we serve can protect them and cause them to succeed and not be defeated as they live out their life's calling and conduct whatever kind of business God leads them into. Now, we have our part to build and guard, but God has his part to build and guard. And we can lay ourselves down in confidence and sleep sweetly if we'll put our trust in God concerning our families. And here's just a few other thoughts that uh, have sort of jumped out at me from these verses in the last couple of weeks. You know, verse 2, 
It says, it's vain for you to sit up late, rise up early, eat the bread of sorrows. And then it ends with this, for so God, he gives his beloved sleep. And then he goes right into talking about our kids. Children are heritage from the Lord. He gives his beloved sleep. You know what beloved means? It means to be loved by God. You are loved by God. Ma'am, you are loved by God. Sir, you are loved by God. And that is connected immediately with the thought of having kids. The greatest thing we can do for our kids is to love them. But we can only fully do that once we embrace the fact that we are loved by God. God loves us, and then he wants to love our children through us. I don't know if you've ever considered this or not, but you know, there's only three instances in the whole New Testament Gospels where God spoke audibly. Three times in the life of Christ where God spoke audibly. I'm sure many times in prayer the Father would have spoken to Jesus, but we have no record of anything God said to him. Only three things that God said to the Son. One, in John 12, Jesus said, Father, glorify your name. A voice came from heaven, says, I have glorified it and will glorify it. The other time was at Christ's baptism. It's recorded in Matthew, recorded in Mark, recorded in Luke. And God said three things to his son about his son. In fact, it's the only record we have, the only record we have in all of the Gospels of the Father speaking directly to the Son about the Son. And God said three things to him. He said, you are my Son, whom I love. With you I'm well pleased. You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And the only other time God spoke audibly was Mount of Transfiguration, and he said virtually the same things to the disciples. This is my Son, whom I love, hear him. Now, why of all the things that God would leave for humanity, the only thing he ever said directly to his son about his son, why is it this? You're my son. Acceptance. Whom I love. Affection. With whom, or with you, I am well pleased. Affirmation. Acceptance, affection, and affirmation. I think God wants us to understand how important it is that we communicate those three things to our children. Yeah. Acceptance, you're my son, you're my daughter, you're part of this family, you belong. And I love you. And show them that you love them. Hug them, embrace them. And you may not come from a real touchy-feely, huggy family, but you need to communicate verbally and in other ways to your children that you love them. And then affirmation. Hey, I'm proud of you, son. I'm proud of you. Even if they're not doing well or doing right at the moment, just say, hey, I know you're trying. I believe in you. You have what it takes. It's so important that we communicate those things to our kids. There are many, many wounded men and wounded women that struggle in life every day because they didn't receive those things growing up. Kids and young people will go looking for those three things in all the wrong places if they don't receive them in the home. And listen to me, parent, if you'll just give those three things to your children, just those three things, acceptance, affection, and affirmation, you have done a lot for your kids. Every person craves those three things. Every person needs them. How blessed is the child that receives them in the home? It will build confidence, stability, and security in their lives. And it says our children are like arrows in our hand. The hand draws the bowstring back. 
The hand determines the, the power, the impetus behind the arrow, and the hand determines the direction that the arrow will fly. God wants to use us to influence our children in the way that they should go. And you know, a, war a warrior never wasted his arrows. He didn't have an unlimited supply of arrows. He was very precise, very careful with his aim. A warrior never just shot an arrow up into the air and said, well, I hope it hits something. <laughs> you know, maybe it'll land true. No, that they took careful aim because they only had a limited amount of arrows. Our job is to observe and then aim our children in the direction of their gifting. I'm going to say that again. Our job is to observe and then aim our children in the direction of their gifting. I bet you know this verse, Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Now, some people say, yeah, I just I tell them what they need to do. I know the way they're supposed to go. Well, actually, you know, the classical Amplified Bible digs, digs, digs a little deeper into the, the actual Hebrew meaning of that. It says, train up a child in the way he should go and in keeping with his individual gift or bent. That's what that means. Train up a child in the way he should go and in keeping with his individual gift or bent his or her God-given inclination. And it talks about the children of one's youth. The best time to start is when you're young as a parent and when your children are small. They will begin displaying certain traits, certain inclinations. Look for those traits and then to help develop them for God's glory and possibly for future employment. You know, all of our kids, they're in their 30s. We're in the grandparent stage right now, and it's, it's glorious. We have three grandsons. They're all quite different. We've got Asher's nine, Sawyer's seven, Clay's two. Asher, very athletic, and he has an amazing mind for numbers. We're on family vacation this summer, and Asher and I were throwing darts. I throw mine, he throws his. I'm walking up to the dartboard, I go, okay, I got a triple 18, double 11, and a four. You got a triple six. Ah, a triple 11 and a seven. And by the time I have said the numbers, he's already added up the sums, and he has both scores. And I go, Asher, how did you do that? And he looks at me like, what are you, stupid, Grandpa? <laughs> and I'm like, that can't be right. And so I add the numbers, you know. It takes me a minute or so. And I go, you're right. And he says, well, Duh. <laughs> we go inside, we're playing chess. Ten minutes into the game, I realize I'm in trouble. <laughs> this kid's going to beat me. Luckily, his dad called him to go play badminton outside. So he goes, Papa, I'm going to go play badminton for a little while. As soon as he's out the door, I knocked every piece off that board. <laughs> There's no way I'm letting a nine-year-old beat me at chess. Asher loves school. Now, his younger brother Sawyer, who's seven, on the other hand, is not quite so fond of school. <laughs> and he loves making things with his hands, and he's actually a genius at it. Spends hours in the backyard creating things out of bits of metal and bits of wood. His favorite gift he's ever gotten was a toolbox when he was six. You know, pliers, hammers, saws, things like that in the little toolbox. One day, I think in under an hour, he made a folding pocket knife out of bits of wood and metal in the backyard that actually worked. It's like, I looked at it, I thought, I don't think I could have done that. He's genius. Now, as parents, or in our case, as grandparents, we need to observe our kids and encourage them in the area of their gifting and teach them both through instruction and example that those gifts should ultimately be used for God's glory. Amen. You know, I hear a lot of people say, well, what's my destiny? You know, what am I called to do with my life? And I, I think those are fairly good questions. But I think a better question may be, what's God up to? What is God doing in the world? 
What's God doing in my city? What's God doing in my church? What's important to God? And then how do my gifts fit into that? How can I use what I'm good at in service of God or in the service of his kingdom? And you know, I think it's important as well that we don't love or favor one child more than another because their gifting or bent is similar to ours. You know, Isaac loved Esau more than he loved Jacob because Esau was a man of the fields. He was a hunter. And his father Isaac related to that. Rebekah, on the other hand, loved Jacob more because he was a man that liked to be inside, the scripture says. He liked to be inside the tents. And that favoritism, Rebekah, because Jacob was more like her, Isaac, because Esau was more like him, it caused huge grief and huge problems in the family. You know, I have an uncle who on his side of the family was set to inherit a lumber business, huge lumber mill in Virginia that had been in the family for generations. And so one generation to another to another. And so he is the heir apparent. But he went to his dad and said, Dad, I don't feel like I'm supposed to be a lumber man. I feel like my gifting is in the area of interior design. I want to be an interior designer. And you know, his dad did something that not many would do. He said, okay. He sold the business, decided to travel the rest of his life around the world. And my uncle went into the interior design business. This has been quite successful and very happy. But listen, most children will not have the courage or the intuition to do that on their own. So what happens, they end up being squeezed into a mold that never was meant to fit them. They'll never be totally fulfilled and they will never have the full impact that they might have had had they been walking in their gifting and according to those inclinations that God had given them. Our children, they're like arrows in our hands. We can touch, bless, direct, give energy and trajectory to our kids. We draw the bowstring back and we send them out for God. And you know, that is the purpose of arrows, is to send them out. They're to be sent out. That's our purpose. We're, we're getting them ready, equipping them to be sent out. Sent out in the area of their, their gifting. Sent out in the area of their inclinations. Not to be clung to. Everybody say, send out. send out. We send them out with encouragement, prayer, with financial help, with faith in God. We send them out. And he said, arrows in the hand of a warrior. I Meaning you're going to have to fight for your kids. Amen. Fight in the place of prayer. Many a night, my wife and I stayed up praying over our, one of our children that was sick. Many a, a night, we stayed up praying over our children even since they've been grown, because they may grow and leave home, but they never outgrow their need for our prayers. And you're going to have to do battle for your kids. You're going to have to be on your knees and pray for them. You are a warrior, ma'am. You are a warrior, sir, and God will use your prayers. Put up that hedge of protection round about them. Pray for your kids. And listen, if they're grown or you realize that you haven't helped them discover their gifting, it's not too late. God will help you. The psalm begins with, unless the Lord builds, unless the Lord guards. If you'll invite him in and solicit his help, he will help. And it's got to start with us that we say, okay, Lord, come on in. You tear down what you want to tear down. You build up what you want to build up. You have complete and full access because I know it's not right to invite you to come and, and build, you know, in my family and yet I've got all these no trespassing signs and off-limit signs for you, these areas that I don't want you to have access in my life. No, we invite the builder in and we say you have full access, sir. We know you know what's best. Another way to say that is 
You've got to make Jesus Lord. Boss, we give him all access. There's no do not enter signs, no off limit signs, no tres there's no, no trespassing signs in our life. Lord, you have access to it all. I'm so glad that you joined us today. Hey, don't turn the television off yet or whatever it means you're listening to me. Stay tuned. You know, we talked about the family and the most important family to be a part of is God's family. And the only way to get in is to be born into his family. Jesus said, you must be born again. Believe in your heart, God raised Jesus from the dead. Confess him with your mouth as Lord and you will be saved. Call on Jesus today. We hope you enjoyed today's message. Order the full version of this teaching on CD, DVD, or MP3 by using the contact details on screen now. Our prayer for you is that you'll continually grow in the wisdom, faith, and power that comes when we hear and apply God's Word in our daily lives. You know, we always go through different things in life. We always have the setting circumstances, the storms of life come to everyone. But in the midst of those storms, there is hope. God always has an answer for us. He always has a pathway for us to walk. And I have a special gift that we wanna get into your hands called There Is Always Hope. It's a bundle of, of messages that will be a blessing to you. In whatever circumstance you're going through, they will bring you hope. I hope that you get it. God wants to get your hopes up, way up, or maybe the hopes of a loved one. Along with two hope-inspiring CD messages, this bundle includes a booklet with Bayless' amazing story of how God completely turned his life around, setting him free from years of addiction and confusion. Call or order online now. Just use the information on your screen and be encouraged. There is always hope.